Over 7 million people flock to France's capital city every year to visit this attraction. The magnificent structure towers over the historic city of Paris and has been an icon of the city for over a century since its completion in 1889. It is one of the most recognizable landmarks in the world. We are talking about the Eiffel Tower of Paris. But why did the French want to build a tower that reaches up, up, up a thousand feet into the sky? What was its purpose? Do you know what material was used to build the tower? These are the questions that might pop into the tourist minds that visit the site. Do you know that it was in the original contract that the structure could be taken down after 20 years and that it wasn't necessarily meant to be permanent? Here at Spark History, we are not only going to take a look at why the Eiffel Tower was built, but also get into how this revolutionary structure came into being and what has enabled it to survive for over a hundred years as a cultural landmark. To see how all of this happened, let's go back in history, back in time, to the year 1884, where our story begins. Hello, and welcome to the Spark History Show, where we bring history to life. Take a dive with us into history and hear the real accounts of the stories of the past as they actually unfolded. Explore with us as we shine some light on the amazing events that shaped our world into what we have today. We are going to recreate the stories of the past to better understand the struggles and triumphs during the most epic moments in history. This is the Spark History Show. Let us begin the journey. Eighteen eighty four. These were boom times for France. After changes in government and the end of the Franco Prussian War, France had evolved into the new Third Republic. Old disputes were settled, and the economy started to take off. Standards of living increased as the Industrial Revolution helped to push the country forward toward a brighter future. The 1870s had brought a great accumulation of wealth to France, as well as colonial territories to expand its empire. By the year 1875, the economic growth enabled France to balance their budget. Moving into the 1880s, the French gained territory in Indochina and North and Central Africa. Historians have given this period of prosperity the name La Belle Epoque, which literally means the good old days. The government leaders of France wanted to celebrate all that their country had achieved in recent years. So, they decided to throw a party. What better way for a country to do this than to celebrate with an international fair showcasing the top technologies of the Industrial Revolution while also performing it on the 100-year anniversary of the French Revolution of 1789? The initial idea of having a big celebration in the capital city of Paris for the year 1889 was first mentioned as early as 1878. It took until November 8, 1884, for President of France Jules Grevy, or Jules Grevy, to proclaim a decree that a universal exposition of the products of industry shall be opened in Paris, May 5, 1889, and close October 31 following. It was this declaration that started the race to build one of the most venerable landmarks in the world, the Eiffel Tower. The objective of the exposition, as declared by the exposition's general manager, Georges Bergy, was, quote, We will show our sons what their fathers have accomplished in the space of a century through progress in knowledge, love of work, and respect for liberty. We will give them a view from the summit of the steep slope that has climbed since the Dark Ages. And if one day they should again descend to some valley of error and misery, they will remember what we did, and they will be more determined than ever to climb still higher that we have. For the law of progress is immortal, just as progress itself is infinite. End quote. This exposition was not a simple neighborhood affair. It would be an epic event to showcase France to the entire world. In the end, the exposition would cover over 228 acres of exhibits for visitors. 
How the design for the Eiffel Tower came into this exposition was that for some time European and American engineers had flirted with the idea of building a 1,000 foot tower or around 300 meters using the new building material of iron. None of these plans, however, had ended up being built into a final structure. The French Minister of Commerce and Industry, Edouard Lucroy, or Edward Lockroy, was put in charge of making the final plans for the exposition of 1889. Thinking about how he could spice up the Paris exposition, Edoua decided to include a contest for architectural designs for the event, the possibility of constructing an iron tower on the base of the Camp de Mars where the event was to be held. The requested base of the tower was to be 125 meters square and a total height of 300 meters. Even though the tower was a possibility and not a requirement, a contest was announced for architectural designs. Even though there were only 16 days to prepare, 100 designs were submitted by the May 18, 1889 deadline. The designs were reviewed by an exposition committee and also released to the general public. After eight days of deliberations, 12 prize winners were selected from the original contestants. The tower that Gustave Eiffel submitted was agreed upon to be the winner for the tower that would be built at the entrance to the exposition, and it would be built by Eiffel's company. Gustave Eiffel was a bona fide engineer by the age of 53. His company, Société de Etablissement Eiffel, had built many other projects using metal as the base material. Some say that there was also a bias given to Eiffel's design as the initial plans for the tower had been floated around in 1884, a full five years before the contest was created for the exposition. The criteria for the contest even included requirements such as a base to the tower of 125 meters or 410 feet square. That was the same measurements on the original design that Eiffel's company had proposed years before. You can make your own speculations on if that was a coincidence or not. The truth is... You can't handle the truth! No, I'm just kidding. But the truth is, we don't really know how much of an influence the original idea for Eiffel's Tower had on the exposition committee and Minister of Commerce and Industry, Edouard Lucroy. We do know that the idea was not developed in the short 16-day period of the contest and that a lot of planning and promotion had already gone into it. Although Eiffel's company presented the project for the tower, it was not Gustave himself that had designed the structure. The designers for the tower were actually architects and engineers in his company, including, and forgive me if I mispronounce these names, Maurice Coquelin, Emile Nouguier, and Stéphane Sauvestre. Even though he didn't create the initial design, it was Gustave Eiffel who had the final say in which of the many available designs from his company would be the final choice. It was the company that he created and ran that would be tasked with building the monument, and the pressure would be on Gustave as the leader of the project if anything ran amiss. When the exposition committee finally selected the Eiffel Tower, they agreed to a contract for an iron tower that could weigh around 7,000 tons and would have to be built for a total cost within $1.6 million, or about 8 million francs. Iron was a new building material, and the engineers at the time wanted to show off just what it could accomplish. Towers in the past had primarily been made of stone. During this time period, there were stone towers such as the Washington Monument in the United States at 555 feet or 169 meters and the Notre Dame Cathedral in France with a height of 226 feet or 69 meters. The new tower designed for Paris was to be double the size of the world's tallest tower at the time, the Washington Monument, and stand around 1,000 feet or 300 meters. Gustav Eiffel felt that the limits of stone masonry used to form towers had already peaked. To build this new tower that would stretch to unseen heights, they would use the strong new building material called wrought iron. 
Eiffel was not contacted in regards to the contract until seven months after he had won the initial contest for the tower. The date was now January 8th, 1887, when Eiffel signed the contract with Edouard Lucroy and the city of Paris. In Article 15 of the contract that the Exposition Committee offered Eiffel, there was an agreement that the tower could be halted in construction or demolished if the state chose to do so, whereby Eiffel would be paid the original sums for the project as well as from the sale of the scrap material. The contract also stipulated that while Eiffel's company would have control for the first 20 years for the operation of the landmark, after this time period the state would assume control and be able to have the tower dismantled and sold for scrap as it would have filled its intended purpose by that time. On the financial side of the contract, the government was going to support Eiffel with a subsidy of $300,000 or 1.5 million francs in three installments to assist with the construction. This $300,000 was, of course, much less than the 1.6 million or 8 million francs cost that was projected to complete the project. Gustave Eiffel and his company were on the hook to come up with the other 1.3 million to pay for the construction. With any damages to the nearby grounds or gardens from the construction, Eiffel also had to provide compensation at the company's expense. After all of these associated costs, Eiffel would then have the possibility, again, there were no guarantees here, of profit that would accumulate by utilizing the new structure as a tourist destination and restaurant with beautiful views of the city. The actual construction of the tower broke ground on January 26th, 1887. There was a large burden on Eiffel's shoulders to deliver not only a dazzling monument for the eternal city, but also a monument to show to the world the strength of France. The official historian of the exposition of 1889 spelled it out this way. This colossal work was to constitute a brilliant manifestation of the industrial strength of our country, attest to the immense progress realized in the art of metal structures, celebrate the unprecedented progress of civil engineering during the course of this century, attract multitudes of visitors, and contribute largely to the success of the great peaceful commemoration of the centenary of 1789. Eiffel himself described the work as an arc of triumph as striking as those that preceding generations had raised to conquerors. Wait a minute, wait a minute. But who was Gustav Eiffel? How did he win a contest to build one of the greatest structures in the city of Paris? To understand the creation of the tower, we have to take a look at some of the background of the man who was able to accomplish this feat. Eiffel graduated from École Centrale des Art et Manufacturers, an engineering school at the age of 22 with a degree in chemical engineering. This choice is a bit interesting with hindsight since he ended up not working in the chemical engineering field in his later years. Originally, his parents had wanted him to attend the Ecole Polytechnic School, where the most prestigious families of the bourgeois class sent their children. The best scientists and mathematicians graduated from Polytechnic and kept the country of France on the cutting edge of technology. Unfortunately, when Eiffel took the admission exam to gain entrance in 1852, he was unable to achieve a passing mark and was denied entry. In the long run, this failure did not seem to set back the aspiring Eiffel, but his parents were disappointed that he would not be able to graduate from the most prestigious school of the day. Eiffel was all set to continue on the path he had envisioned of working at his uncle's vinegar distillery in Dijon, France when he studied chemical engineering at Centrale. That is the same city of Dijon that is famous for Dijon mustard, where mustard had been a center of industry there since the 13th century. Gustave's father had met his mother when he was stationed in the city of Dijon after fighting in Napoleon's army, and it is there where Gustave Eiffel was conceived and lived his early life. It made sense for him to join a family business in his hometown after graduating. The problem was that while he was in school, Gustave's family had a falling out with his uncle's side of the family, and that ended up in the two sides not talking to each other anymore. When Gustave graduated, that once guaranteed position at the vinegar distillery from his uncle 
turned into a strong no for any type of employment opportunity, and young Eiffel had to search elsewhere for his career. While searching for a job in Paris, Eiffel was offered a position by a man named Charles Nepveau, who worked with the French Society of Civil Engineers. With a job offer of $30 a month as personal secretary to Charles Nepveau, Eiffel took the position, hoping to learn the ins and outs of the business firsthand. After a few months, the business started to run into financial trouble. Nepveau proved to be a better engineer than manager of a business, and his company ended up going bankrupt. But Nepveau and Eiffel were both saved when a Belgian railway company merged with their company to gain their assets and created the General Railway Equipment Company. With the merger, Nepveau and Eiffel were to operate in the Paris branch with Nepveau as director and Eiffel with the new position of Chief of Research at the new salary of $50 per month. This merger set up Eiffel working in one of the most important industries of the time, the railway business. Keep in mind that in the mid-1800s, railroads were busy connecting the world. It offered Eiffel experience in an industry that was using the building material of iron for industrial construction and grew around the new technology of steam locomotion. The railroad transportation industry also attracted tons of money from capitalist investors of the time, as it was one of the, shall we say, the fastest moving industries. Anyway, rivers, gorges, and valleys created huge obstacles for the railway lines that needed straight path and minimal grade to ensure the most effective transportation. Two railway companies were laying track when they found the Garonne River blocking their planned route. This is where Gustave Eiffel came in, when he signed a contract with the company's Compagnie des Orleans and Compagnie du Midi in 1858 to complete a cast iron bridge by June 1860 crossing the river. I like this story because it gives us a taste of the character of Eiffel. The allotted two years was a very tight time frame to build the bridge. The overwater passage would have to be built of heavy-duty iron construction to support heavily loaded train cars repeatedly crossing. The deck of the bridge would have to be approximately 510 meters or 1,672 feet to cross the Long River. The total operation had a cost of $600,000 of which Gustav Eiffel was responsible for. Keep in mind that this is the time when a decent wage was around $50 per month. Showing the drive and determination that would help him in his later years, Gustav put his head down and charged forward with the project. He began to work 16-hour days to ensure that everything would be completed on time. Realizing that the standard method of inserting the bridge pylons into the strong current of the river would be a slow and grueling task, Eiffel decided to use a new technology that he had heard about when working with Nepveu. He refined the technology to use a hydraulic press and compressed air to sink pylons 80 feet down into the Caron riverbed. The dedicated work of the construction crew and Gustav Eiffel led the bridge to be completed on time. It ended up being one of the largest iron bridges in the world at the time of its construction. The bridge showed that Eiffel could use his precision skills in engineering to implement new technologies and also that he had the managerial skills to adapt and complete a project on budget and on time. The bridge helped set up his reputation as a respected engineer. There was one incident during the course of building the bridge that also shows a bit of Eiffel's character. One of the workers had been sipping a bit too much of the vino on his lunch break, and while coming back to work, he slipped and fell into the river. <gasps> the strong current had a grasp on him and started to pull him away. Eiffel, seeing the incident, threw off his overclothes and his shoes and jumped into the river to save the man. Always being a strong swimmer, he was able to reach the man and pull him back to shore. When he came back ashore, and started to put his clothes back on, he proclaimed to the workers gathered around looking at him with respect, Please be good enough to attach yourselves carefully in the future. 
The bridge across the river Garonne was completed when Eiffel was 26 years old. Many engineers at the time were using trial and error to construct their architectural feats. Eiffel, in contrast to this, had a carefully planned, measured, and executed strategy for construction. His brisk completion of the bridge with minimal safety issues, few structural changes, and along with the end result of one of the largest iron bridges of its time, showed the effectiveness of his strategy. His company gained more and more contracts and continued to grow after the completion of the Garonne Bridge. He even opened up his own ironworks in a suburb of Paris. The expansion of railroad tracks across all of France in the mid-1800s offered Eiffel's company plenty of work in building new iron bridges. After doing his own tests, Eiffel published a scientific report on the elasticity of wrought iron that other architects used as a building block when designing their own structures. In Eiffel's work building bridges, it is important to note that none of his bridges failed and many are still in use even to this day. Other bridges around the world did not fare so well during this time period and structural failures and collapses were very common. For some context, in a 10 year period in the United States, there were 251 railway bridges that failed. In France in 1850, the Andrews Bridge collapsed while in stormy and high wind conditions while soldiers were marching across. 200 of the soldiers perished in the collapse. In 1878, the Tay Bridge in Scotland was experiencing strong winds while a passenger train tried to make its way across. The bridge gave out due to the stress and the passengers. All 75 of them were killed in the disaster. The structural integrity of a bridge was not always a sure thing. Eiffel structures were designed considering the wind loads that would be put onto the structure. A trademark part of his design is the web-like wrought iron that made up the bulk of his bridges. It basically looks like a spider web. The wind was able to pass through the gaps built into the design and prevented additional load from bearing on the structure. Envision how a sail bellows in the wind. If the standard building design was made with solid iron, the large flat surface that would be created is similar to a sail collecting the full force of the wind. There is nowhere for the air to go, except directly against the broad face of the structure and push against it until it can force itself around the edges. Eiffel knew the exact strength of his building materials and how thin or how many cutout areas he could have in his design and still maintain the ever important structural stability. This is the same style which would later be used in the construction of the Eiffel Tower, giving it its very specific aesthetic of a web-like iron. Over the next couple decades, Eiffel and his company would construct over 40 railway bridges. By the 1870s, they were bidding on international contracts as well. As a result of construction of a bridge in Portugal of 200 foot height, his company received a request to build a record-setting bridge over the Trier River in France. A river had cut its way through the mountainous terrain over thousands of years in this area, and since the river was in a deep valley, strong wind currents would flow over the river, making bridge building very difficult. The initial plan was requested in 1879, with construction starting in 1882. The project became known as the Garabit Viaduct. The bridge had a cost of nearly $630,000 and was 400 feet high with a length of 1,850 feet. Upon completion in 1884, the new iron bridge was the largest arch bridge in the entire world. The Garabit Viaduct became Eiffel's trademark and most famous work of the time. The 3,587 tons of wrought iron stood firm, towering over the landscape, showing the amazing feat of engineering that this man and his company were able to accomplish. The bridge was his most successful achievement until the creation of the one and only Eiffel Tower. Eiffel's other international works included creating an iron train station of 140,000 square feet in Hungary 
and another bridge 262 feet in length in French Indochina. The precision in Eiffel's work was spot on. When the test load, also known as the proof load, was put on the Garabit viaduct, the measurement of deflection in the bridge was exactly, exactly the 8 millimeters that Eiffel had predicted in his calculations and designs. Being exact to the millimeters, well, that sounds pretty good to me. Eiffel and his company had achieved success even before the construction of the Eiffel Tower, and all of these projects and experiences led them to create the masterpiece that would become the Eiffel Tower. Those of you that have been to New York City in the United States might also find it interesting that Eiffel left his touch there as well. That beautiful statue of a woman reaching with her torch into the sky, inviting new arrivals to New York Harbor, actually had some architectural designs from Eiffel. That's right, the Statue of Liberty is able to hold her torch so high in the air for all to see because of Eiffel's design of an interior iron skeleton that was able to support the massive weight of the copper sheets on the outside of the structure. Although Eiffel had many achievements that we have already mentioned and was known in his field as a good architect, he was not a household name. The building of the Eiffel Tower would change that. We heard a bit about the backstory of where Eiffel and his company had come from, but now let's jump into the thick of things in the year 1887, when the project to build the tower broke ground. Eiffel had won the contest and he had the design. Now he had to find a way to make his dream a reality. In January of 1887, results from samples of the earth beneath the Camp de Mars site came in. The base of the tower would form a square with four points of foundation. As you usually see with architects, they try to incorporate natural aesthetics into the architectural work to make it more pleasing to the eye. This can be seen when builders follow something such as the golden ratio to determine the right size of different points in their structure. In the Eiffel Tower's foundation, the four points where the tower met the earth, the foundation would align with the points on the compass, north, south, east, and west. When the samples of the earth came back from the lab for the east and south feet of the tower, they showed the materials that made up most of Paris's foundation, 50 feet of gray clay supported by a strong foundation of chalk underneath. These were very suitable materials to build into with the tower's foundation. The problem was that the north and west corners of the tower would be placed near the bank of the Seine River, and this area did not have as sure of a foundation. The core samples by the river showed a sandy mud on the upper layers, which contained logs, pottery fragments, and masonry pieces from an old wall. This type of terrain was hardly suitable for any type of major foundation. Nothing had been built yet, and the design had run into a huge issue if the ground would not be able to support the weight of the structure. The very outset of the construction and the whole project was in jeopardy. How could Eiffel get around the foundation issue and still complete the project on time for the fair in two years? Eiffel got straight to work investigating the troubled north and west points for the tower. He had his men construct special caissons in the area to dig to a deeper depth and see if there was a solid foundation to be had at lower levels. A caisson is basically a watertight retaining structure that can hold back water or soil and allow workmen to dig down deeper into the earth in a protected environment. The ones that Eiffel's company built had a special decompression chamber built at the top above ground. There was then a seven foot in diameter enclosed cylinder that drove down more and more as earth was removed underneath in the workman's chamber. When the workmen got to the bottom of the cylinder, they entered another area that was like a mine where the ground could be excavated. The airlock on top of the caisson was needed because just like when a scuba diver from today's times goes down into the depths of the ocean, when men went deep underground into the earth, the pressure on the body changes substantially. If men quickly ascend from the caisson and then went out into the open world, they would get a sickness called the bend, similar to what scuba divers have to watch out for when they ascend from their dive too fast. 
This is where bubbles of gas form in the body due to rapid decompression and can cause joint pain, pain in the chest, and paralysis as just a few of the symptoms. With the design that they used, safety was paramount and there were no cases of decompression sickness during the building of the tower. The workmen ended up using the caissons to dig down 48 feet to see if there was a more stable ground composition for the construction. Luckily, the men started to find layers of sandy clay and less of the debris found in the upper layers. Just to make sure the area would be suitable, Eiffel had the troops dig down another 5 feet, and luckily enough, they hit the same strong gray clay that had been found on the other legs of the tower away from the riverbed. If they just dug down a little deeper to set the legs on these issue sides, well, 16 feet deeper to be exact, they would have the sturdy foundation they were looking for. Crisis averted. A solution had been found to the issues with the foundation and the construction could begin. The workmen immediately got started with the foundations in the four corners of the tower. It was March 1887, and they had less than two years to go before the grand opening of the fair when the tower had to be ready. Each of the four legs of the tower had four caissons built in the area to excavate the ground. The caissons were pretty advanced for their time, but Eiffel had been used to working with these engineering tools when he had built bridges in the past. Since the chambers were all airtight and kept under pressure, the pressure stopped any water from seeking into the work area from the nearby riverbed. The Eiffel Tower would weigh less than if the building material of stone had been used, but the large metallic part of the structure would still have an estimated weight of 7,300 tons. Although the new building material of iron with a web-like structure greatly reduced the weight, the tower still needed a strong foundation to hold it up. But to give you an idea of the weight savings on the tower's new construction material of iron, let's compare the structure to the stone-built structure of the Washington Monument in the United States. The Washington Monument is a 600-foot tall stone obelisk. When completed, the total weight of the obelisk was 81,000 tons, or about 162 million pounds. This compares to the taller 1,000-foot Eiffel Tower with a weight of only 7,300 tons, or 16 million pounds. Again, a comparison of 81,000 tons to 7,300 tons shows the immense difference. This helps to set the idea of what kind of amazing new structures could be built with iron instead of stone as the building material, utilizing all of these weight savings. To support the weight of the Eiffel Tower, the four piers of the monument were placed at an angle into the earth to have their mass exerted at right angles. With the 40,500 cubic yards of earth that were removed by utilizing the caissons, the piers of the tower were able to be sunk into 28 feet of wet cement. 26 foot long and 4 inch in diameter anchor bolts were secured in the cement, then reached upward through large blocks of quarried stone that sat on top of the cement, and then onward to the iron tower. The end of the anchors that were inside the cement also had an iron shoe that connected the anchor cylinders together. To add an extra safety on this new type of construction, the foundations were designed to withhold pressure of up to 421 pounds per square inch, which was 41 times the expected load. Imagine someone building a house and saying that it would be able to take winds up to 41 times the normal rate. That might make you feel a bit safer when the next hurricane comes in. Is it just me or in today's world of planned obsolescence, does it seem like they just don't make things like they used to? The four piers were rapidly constructed and completed in a time period of just five months. But just making the same old foundations with iron anchors was a bit too simple for Eiffel. He wanted to add his own little secret weapon. In what is called the shoe, where the iron columns met the stone foundation, Eiffel added a little something extra. There was a spot where the iron connected with the pier of cement below it. This spot was comprised of a hollow iron cylinder that connected the metal structure to the stone blocks and cement in the foundation. It is in this spot, in the hollow cylinder, that Eiffel inserted pistons 
that could use water pressure to change the height of each individual column. In the design, there were 16 total columns that would enter the foundations. Each corner of the tower would have four columns of support going into the pier foundation of stone and cement. The problem with this is that if one leg was a little off, the incorrect angle would be amplified through the structure as it went higher until the top would look completely crooked. The smart idea that Eiffel had was to use the hydraulic piston design to ensure that when the construction was connecting the first platform between the legs of the tower, the height could be adjusted to ensure the first platform was completely flat and the tower was not leaning to one side or another on a shorter leg. The expert design and limited weight of the tower was described well in the book, The Tallest Tower by Joseph Harris. The book states, quote, Eiffel's calculations indicated that pressure on the earth beneath the masonry foundations would range from a minimum of 58 pounds to a maximum of 64 pounds per square inch, depending on the wind force and which pier was being considered. This was well within the limits that the substrata could bear. In fact, it is not much more pressure than a well-fed gentleman exerts on the floor when sitting on a spindly leg chair." End quote. Another interesting fact about the weight of the tower that tour guides like to throw at you when you're visiting is that if you are able to take a giant cylinder and drop it down over the tower with a helicopter or something, and then remove the tower from the cylinder, and then measure the weight of the air that would remain in the cylinder, the actual weight of the air would be around 10,000 tons, which is even heavier than the tower's weight of 7,300 tons. Yes, that includes a larger cubic area than the actual tower, as the tower gets narrower as it moves towards the top, but still. Try doing that with any other building material of the time, like stone or wood. The comparison wouldn't even be close. Eiffel and his team had to be expert in design, as there was no precedent for what they were trying to create. It was something new and exciting, but also risky. They had to make large numbers of very precise calculations, and had no computers to perform the math, or software to do 3D modeling and testing. To avoid any issues, all calculations were made to within one-tenth of a millimeter of accuracy. When creating the designs, the expected wind pressures were measured as though the parts of the tower were made of solid, flat-faced iron, which would receive the highest amount of wind pressure. Since the actual tower had a web-like latticework of iron, rather than the flat sides, the stress due to wind was greatly reduced and helped to keep the structure standing for over 129 years now. Eiffel had discovered that this technique worked well when constructing bridges of iron. And again, he used it here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of part one of the Eiffel Tower series. If you would like additional details or view photos to help frame the story, head over to the website at sparkhistory.com to see the show notes. Check out part two to see how the tower continues to rise in construction. But of course, with such a large project that affects a capital city with millions of people, drama starts to rise between the citizens, the managers of the project, and the labor. We will see it all unfold in part two. Subscribe to the show or follow us on Twitter at Spark History to get news about upcoming episodes and make sure you are aware when the next part is released. Thank you everyone for listening and have a great day.